the Lord goes so far as to say, hey, if, if anything troubles you, and anxiety begins to grip you, you just need to take a walk about the lawns and the fields and, and look up a little bit and just notice the flower of the field. It's really interesting that that was the Lord's encouragement for anxiety. Just go take a walk, look at that flower again, and look at that bird again. And then the Lord made this astounding statement. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And every single thing that you and I would need will be given to you. You seek first in your anxiety and in your predicament. Seek first. And then the Lord makes this astounding promise. Everything that you need will be given to you. I want to read it to you from the Message Bible. And just a little bit here. He says, people who don't know God and the way in which He works fuss over the things of life. But you know God, and you know how He works. Steep, therefore, your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all of your everyday human concerns will be met. Again, the Lord says here, this is from the Message Bible, steep yourself. In the Old English, seek first. And this is a cornerstone verse for Wayne and I for some 20 years. And we thought it best to take a few minutes and share with you the bizarre the crazy way in which an African met an American girl from Valdosta, Georgia. Wendy, do you want to start it off? Sure, I can. Um, I did want to say I love the way it talks about uh, seeking first being something God initiates that it's the reality of God, the provision of God, it's His initiative, it's all His work in us and through us, and we just get to cooperate with that. So as you hear our story, uh, just know there's nothing special about us. We're very much like you. Um, I'll give you my story. I have a much more traditional American story than Francois, but our hope is that you will be encouraged to trust God, to seek Him first, and to believe that He will provide for you, uh, and He will have God's stories and miracles that He wants to do for you. We, um, well, my story, I grew up in Valdosta, Georgia, uh, sort of an all-American football town, and I ended up at Auburn University, just a couple of hours down the road, I had an amazing four years at Auburn. I was a part of the Greek system there, uh, very involved, loved every minute of my experience, never missed a home football game, made friends that have lasted a lifetime. And um, I also really met God in a deeper way during college. I had grown up in a Christian family. I had grown up in the church, but for me, college was a season where my faith became my own. It became real to me, apart from my family, apart from my culture. Um, I got to do different ministry programs in the summer, and I really began to understand what it meant to enjoy a relationship with God throughout my day. You know, I'd be walking across my campus and just get to talk to Him, include Him, uh, pull out my Bible or spiritual book and read. I had amazing believing friends. And so Christ really began to become my life. And I was a pre-med major at Auburn and really enjoyed what I studied. But I began to have some questions about whether that was really the calling of God on my life, whether it's really what He was wanting me to do with the precious years I had on this planet. And 
I knew at that point in my walk with him that I had to hear his voice. I had to know what it is he was calling me to do before I could move forward. So rounding out my senior year, I really sensed like a divine pause where God was asking me to wait. And, you know, the high achiever, the person who had planned my life, and, you know, I've always kind of known what was next. For me, a radical step of faith was to go to my parents and say, I need a year. I need to, you know, do some volunteer work, um, just take a breather and really pray into what it is God would have me do after college. And I remember I had some plans for the fall, and uh, New Year's rolled around with some friends, and God took me to Psalm 84, and he said, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And you know, there are times when we read scripture and it just leaps off the page and uh, really embeds itself in our heart. And, and I knew God was saying to me that the life that I was being called to was going to be a pilgrimage of sorts, where I may not always know exactly what's next or what's around the bend, but there was going to be a, a daily listening, walking with him, uh, experiencing what he had in the journey, and that it was going to be a radical call to just living without all of the lifelong plans, you know, without knowing what's next. And, and there was a piece where I really realized it wasn't being irresponsible to not plan the rest of my life, but that at least for this season, God wanted me to trust him and just to continue to take the small steps forward as he revealed them. And so in this year off, um, a door opened for me. Um, I was interested in doing um, some mission work and maybe volunteering, using some Spanish. And so it was through that desire in my heart that the Lord began to kind of open doors of what was next. You want to go ahead? I did not grow up in a family that had any reverence for God. I grew up in a family that we cursed God. We used His name to hurt other people. So I did not grow up in uh, the Christian faith. I did not know the name of Jesus except, again, as a curse word. But at age 17, I did meet the living Lord. And my life radically turned upside down. In fact, um, I was hoping to go into hotel and tourism industries, and at age 17, I meet Jesus, and just like that, I lost my appetite for a hotel and casino and, and, and resort and island life. That was my fantasy. That was my hope. That was my, my lust and my dream and my ambition, to live somewhere in the sun, in the middle of the Caribbean, and just live it up. As a typical teenager, I had that dream, and I, I earnestly began to fantasize about this whole idea of, of a resort. And then I met Jesus, and it's the best day of my life. Amen. Because all that vain, glorious pursuit and that selfish ambition, it just left me the day that I said yes to the Lord. And I began to steep myself in God's reality. And I'm not saying God cannot be on an island or God cannot use a person or reach a person at a resort. But for me, as I began to steep myself into God, God spoke to me um, and said that I would one day be used of God to have a school that teaches people how to walk with God. And so I relayed this to my family one particular evening. And they were so troubled with me going after this God thing. And, and in South Africa, they, 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 they said, he got Jesus, and I'm on some kind of a fad, and, and it will run its course. But about a year later, it did not run its course. In fact, it actually intensified. A year after having met the Lord, I was more in love with God than ever before. And my family, they were so bothered and troubled by, the, by this idea that I'm going to live for God. They asked me to leave the house. 
And in a very respectful way, my family told me, um, we'll take care of you till you're 18 years old. And thereupon, you're on your own. We don't want you in our life. You can take your Jesus and hit the road, Jack. Well, through my 17th, 18th years, I'm growing spiritually and I'm beginning to hear God that I'm going to have a school one day. I had no idea how was God going to bring about this particular promise. And I had all of these confirmations and I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew God was going to use me. And so I studied a bit, I went to school a bit, and I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a racehorse here in Kentucky. Just prior to uh, that race, those horses that are in those cages, they're just twitching, and they are so ready to, to, to get going and for that gate to open up. And you can just literally see those horses, they're just like shaking with anticipation. Well, after I studied a bit and... and um, prepared myself for, for, for ministry and to be used of God, I was literally shaking, and so were all of my peers. And then God just pulled the rug out under my feet and told me, I want you to go to the United States, to Arkansas. Excuse me, <laughs> you didn't hear me. Hello? Hello? Arkansas. That's not why people come to America. <laughs> but I knew that I knew that I knew God had spoken to me. I should go to the middle of nowhere, in fact, the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas, and I should go to a Franciscan monastery. And I should go and weed their gardens for a year. And that bothered me. <laughs> that really troubled me. Again, I was twitching, so ready to be used of God. But I had to steep myself in the reality of God. I had to seek first and still the kingdom of God. And by faith, I jumped on an airplane in 1998, and I came to Arkansas to a Franciscan, you may have heard of Francis of Assisi. It's a community in Arkansas with people that live a very austere life. They fast twice a week. They don't marry. They wear these strange robes, these garments. It looks like they're in a bathrobe all day long. And they, they live a, a very strict, disciplined life. And God told me that I should go and for one year weed their flower gardens. Well, that's the very last thing I had on my mind. But I want to tell you, seeking God first... And steeping yourself in God will often land you in the nonsensical, even the absurd. My family mocked me and, and, and ridiculed me. It just did not make sense. Why would you study and why would you, you know, go through training to go and be on your knees for an entire year taking care of other people's weeds in their garden? And just... I just, I could not get an answer out of God. It's one of those things where you wrestle with God. Why are you doing this to me? Are you punishing me? Did I do something wrong? And what will be the end of this? I want to tell you, it is never obedient. Uh, how can I say? It's never convenient to obey God. At times, obedience to God is, is, is often just outlandish. Perhaps some of you, even coming to this very school, was the calling of God. God sent you to the school. And maybe some family members laughed at you and mocked them. Why in the world would you go to Samford University? Because God said so. I humbled myself because I've also discovered that uh, it is never expedient to disobey God. As awkward and as humbling as it is to obey, it is still the very best thing to do. In fact, 
Every man and woman of God that has ever walked with God ever in the history of this world can testify that God's way is always, always, always better. If you can seek God and you can steep yourself in obedience to God, hmm, it's going to be better in any life you can script or control or predict. Well, the Lord had an enormous surprise for me when I landed in Arkansas. So I had blue jeans on and a pair of sandals and a t-shirt, and I lived and worked in that Arkansas humidity, something I'm not used to. And day in and day out, all I did was pull weeds out of a vegetable garden. And as I could script life, as I could imagine life, I was going to finish my one-year stint at this particular monastery. Um, there's, there's no young people there. It's all these gray-haired people, and they, they shuffle, and they're quiet. They don't talk. And I was going to finish my one year and head back to South Africa like that racehorse, and I was going to get back in the game of life. How wrong I was. So in the year that I felt the Lord call me to pause, you know, New Year comes around. I, I don't know anything other than I have a wedding in June on my calendar. I'm really seeking the Lord. I remember just worshiping in my bedroom, and it, it was such a developmental season for me spiritually. I was desperate for the Lord. I had to hear him speak. I had to see um, his will and have him open up the next steps. And so it was an opportunity to really flex those faith muscles and those learning to listen muscles. And as I was looking at opportunities and being faithful to, you know, make decisions and do my part to investigate opportunities, there was a, a door that opened up sort of halfway um, through this organization in Arkansas. And they said, well, we have this medical clinic and we might be open to sending you to the Spanish-speaking country, but first we'd need you to come to our home base and let us get to know you and see if it might actually be a good fit. And so I got in my car and began my drive. It took me a couple days. Uh, and by faith, decided I was going to do this crazy thing and drive up to Arkansas and move in to this Franciscan monastery for a month or two. And I remember, you know, arriving and they actually escorted me to where the nuns live. There was a, you know, a men's monastic community, but also a female nun community. And I had a, a room, they call it a cell, just like the nuns. Well, I grew up Southern Baptist. I'd never hung out with a nun in my whole life. So it was the most out-of-the-box experience I could have ever imagined, but it was quiet, and it was an opportunity to read and to listen and to pray and to work in gardens, and God just began to continue to speak and move in my heart, and it was a small community, and there, there weren't a lot of people there, and I noticed early on there's this guy here who looks my age, and he doesn't wear the habit, and I couldn't totally figure out how he fit in. Uh, but, you know, after a week or so, you get lonely enough and... Say hello. <laughs> yeah, so we're in a, you know, pre-meeting. We're sitting there waiting on the others to come in. So I started peppering him with questions. And where's your accent? And who are you? And what are you here doing? And quickly, we just realized we had a built-in buddy at the monastery. Somebody who, you know, was from outside that monastic culture, young, loved God, wanted to grow, um... And it just felt like such an unexpected blessing to actually have a friend. I would never have scripted a one-year weed-pulling gig in Arkansas for my life. I had no interest in Franciscanism, Catholicism, living a monk life. I had no awareness of any of these types of things. But you know, when Lord, the Lord speaks, He will also give you the grace to obey if you can humble yourself. And even when it does not make sense, if you can touch 
what the Lord is saying to you with your heart. A, a strange faith will stir within you. A strange grace will stir within you to bear when you're in the inexplicable and you're in the absurd. Well, there I am at this monastery, and it's, it's about, oh, maybe nine months or so into my time there, and I am frustrated out of my brains because I so wanted to be used of God, and I so wanted to just minister for the Lord and teach and start the school that God had told me I was going to start. And here I am in absolute silence all day, in loneliness all day long, and I'm on my knees pulling weeds. In fact, I spent the better part of eight days, eight hours a day on my knees and my chest even got so constricted that I couldn't hardly stand up from the tightness in it. And all the while I'm shaping, sh shaking my fist onto that vegetable garden, why am I here? You're here to seek first the kingdom of God. You're here to steep yourself in the reality of God. There were so many days that I wanted to abort this mission. In the natural, like all men, we're atypical, have no patience, no endurance. Um, I could not see what God was doing, and it started to bother me. And again, I was frustrated, and I was disillusioned at times, but I just knew I could not abort this mission. It was going to be my flesh that's uncomfortable with this assignment. But in my heart of hearts, in my spirit, I knew I was right where God had me for that very uh, year. So here I am in the gardens, mad and frustrated, and a woman walks up to me. Hey, why do you talk so funny? Where are you from? And she asked me to teach her how to milk the cow. A little awkward, <laughs> sitting around a cow and uh, positioning yourself, you know, hands around her hands and Seriously, this is exactly what we did <laughs> in a Franciscan monastery. I uh, weeded the flowers, but I also attended to the milking of the cows twice a day. So there's this woman, this stranger. We had the best time milking cows. Listen, this is not a dating talk. <laughs> but if you want some awesome date, ladies, <laughs> gents, go find you a cow. Help each other's hands. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's the best and worst day of my life. Well, I began to like this girl, and I had a suspicion she liked me in return. And slowly, my heart was drawn towards this girl. It was the dead of the winter. I could not see much of her cute little body. All I had to work with was a face and an enormous personality. And I fell in love with a person. And uh, I did not know that by obeying God in the absurd, I did not know that seeking first, when it does not make sense, God would give to me a buddy in my life to live life with. When and I fell in love in that year of early 99, we progressed in a relationship and it was time for me to leave the United States and go back to South Africa. My one-year visa had run its course and it was time to put me on a jet plane back to South Africa. And I wanted to be brave knowing that I had met this amazing person and um, well, I'll go back to South Africa and we can email or, you know, try to sort of write a little bit. And there was no video conference calling, no Skype, no Zoom at that time. And I had this illusionary fantasy idea, wow, we would stay in relationship. But really, had I left the United States, there was no way possibly that we could have, you know, maintained or even pursued and cultivated our relationship. So I wanted to be brave, but I knew, oh, it's time to go back to South Africa. My one-year fling in America is over, and I'm about to lose an incredible girl. And then 
the absurd happens again. So from my perspective, I just wanted to share that one of the things I had really felt uh, impressed to pray about when I was in college was about my future spouse, like probably most of you. But the, the testimony that I heard from other couples and the thing that was most urgent in my heart was that I wanted God to write that story. I wanted it to be something that only God could do and that in no way, you know, as a female, was I manipulating. You know, there was always a temptation to like be outside the classroom at a certain time and, you know, see this guy and, you know, oh, he's going to be doing this extracurricular activity. So maybe I'll get involved in that as well. And, and you know, there was just this huge temptation to try to manipulate circumstances. And yet the seek first part of me realized that my focus needed to be on the Lord and that he was far better capable of writing my story and orchestrating my circumstances to bring the right life partner to me in his timing. And so I left college and, you know, hadn't met anyone. And what I did accomplish was to make friendships that are literally my best friends to this day. So, you know, a part of my story in college is that in seeking first the kingdom, God added to me amazing believing friends who have shaped my entire life. Um, you know, I, I really thank the Lord. Instead of investing a lot of time in a relationship that wasn't going to last, I invested in friendships that have changed the course of my life. I'm actually heading out in a couple days to do a girls weekend and friends are flying in and um, here we are 25 years later still investing time together um, and encouraging each other. And they're actually the group of friends who've been praying for us uh, today, even as we prepared to share. So um, in my dating, I, I wanted it to be a God story as well. So what I love so much about having met my husband in a Franciscan monastery is that you can imagine it was the last thing I expected to have happened to me when I pulled my car into the driveway in Northwest Arkansas. There was no ulterior motive in my heart. There were no eligible men, you know, that I could have anticipated. There was no dating opportunity. And yet it's the one location in the entire planet that God led me to that connected me with the spouse that he had destined for me. And I love that testimony in my own life, but I love to share it because I just want to say, you know, to any of you, Great. It can be Sanford. I understand there's a, more girls than guys here. You know, God doesn't care about ratios. Come on. It actually doesn't bother him at all. It takes one person in the right place at the right time. And what it will require of you is obedience, seeking first his kingdom. Just, hey, Lord, I, I don't know why you want me to serve in this way on campus, but sure. If this is something you put on my heart, I'll do it. Um, now, don't do it to hope you meet a spouse, but get ready to be blessed in some form or fashion when you say yes to the Lord and you seek first his kingdom and you obey and do the things that he invites you to do. Um, so the connection of Francois being able to stay longer, um, we connected at the monastery. I thought he was super cute. Uh, and would have loved to have spent more time with him, but again, he's heading back. Uh, so we got to spend a little extra time together before he left. And in that short window, I took him by to connect with some ministry leaders that I had known in my college years. And I, I don't even think they knew we liked each other necessarily. I mean, there was no like prearranging anything. We walk out of the office and Francois had just been given a job for the next five months to be a part of that ministry organization. I had had a door open for me to go to South America to do the missions, uh, stuff that was on my heart. But before long, I'm heading out of the country, he's staying in America, and we now though have this path to just stay in touch, to continue to connect. The Lord opens a door for him to be in the US, and we're starting to think maybe God's up to something. And so, yeah, I uh, fully in my mind scripted going back to South Africa, and all of a sudden, my visa gets extended. The Lord just brings people across my path, and that's my testimony, really, of the last 22 years living in the United States. 
If you seek first and steep yourself in the kingdom of God, God will do whatever it takes. In fact, He'll bring whomever you need at whatever particular time. For whatever reason that is on God's agenda, He will get the resources to you, the people to you. And so here I am, all of a sudden a man meets me, he's like, yeah, I'll pay for your visa, I'll extend it, I'll fly you out to California to go work at this and that particular camp. Next thing I know, I'm engaged to this girl. A miracle, her dad said yes. <laughs> Next thing I know, we live in California and have the greatest job on planet Earth. Next thing I know, God just begins to connect us with people and with networks. And all of the, the, the while I'm wondering, God, how am I going to start a school? I've been very blessed that since age 18, I have known what to do in life and where God was going to take me. The only thing is I've not known how the Lord was going to make that happen. So I've never swerved from a very straight and narrow calling in my life. I am among the very few that knew that I knew that I knew at a young age, this is what God has in front of me. So there we are living in California, and I knew God wanted to start a school. But how do I start a school? I have no resources. I have no connections. And the Lord starts bringing people across our path. Next thing we know, the Lord speaks to us. And says, move to Birmingham. And I had visited this city prior, and I was not impressed. I'm from Africa. <laughs> Things look a little different there. And so this city was slightly too big for me. It was too busy. I was not quite that comfortable. And I, I, I bucked a bit. Yeah. But we ended up here in 2003. For me, it was outlandish. Why would God send me to Birmingham, Alabama? We show up here, and we begin to meet people. And God be begins to bring resources. And I had a little storefront coffee shop here in Birmingham at that time. And people would come, and we would pray and minister. And, but all the while, I would wonder, how are we going to start this school? In 2007... God speaks to us again and said, it's time to start the school. Long story short, here we are 13 years later, and God has allowed for us to start a school here in a coffee shop. Then it progressed to a farm that we rented on the other side of Tuscaloosa. And while we were at that farm for some five seasons, God spoke to us and said, I'm going to give you land, kind of like he did to Abraham. I'm going to give you land. And by now I was beginning to wonder, am I just living the American dream? Yada, 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 yada. God, what are you doing? And lo and behold, in 2013, this family invites us down to Lake Martin. <laughs> Listen, I grew up in the desert in Africa. We don't have water the way you have it here in America, much less the way you have it at Lake Martin, just south here. I show up at Lake Martin with Wendy and our two little girls in 2013, and this man sits us down that we had met one time. And he's grilling out a hamburger for us, and we're going to eat. And he, he's kind of a big man, a little intimidating man. And he said, boy, tell me about your school. What is this? legacy school of discipleship thing about? What is your ministry about? And I shared with him, sir, it's for college people. It's for folks somewhere in their 20s who really want to go deep with God. Some of them are beginners in God. Some of them are quite seasoned in God. But this school is for Jesus seekers, kingdom seekers, people who are not worrying about money, and houses, and land, and jobs, and spouses, and pedigrees, and societal cliques, but people who really want to live for God, and yet be teachers, be business people, be doctors, and nurses, and lawyers, and e economists, etc. But this man cooking out this burger for us, he was so impressed, and touched, and moved with Wen and I's simple vision that there and then he gave us an enormous property on Lake Martin 
with a brand new furnished lake house. Am I telling the truth? You are. And this man just says right there on the spot, here's your property, build a campus. And since 2013 rolled around, all of a sudden we inherited land. We, we just walked into land. But we didn't have money. Again, I'm an immigrant. We have a small ministry. And all of a sudden, because we steep ourselves in God, because we trust God and we're anxious for nothing, and I'm not worried and biting my nails and manipulating life, like Wendy said a minute ago, manipulating circumstances to get that man or to get that woman or to get that job, but really steeping yourself in God. We began to watch starting in 2016 and 7. God just began to, out of the blue, shower us with resources so much so that we built an entire campus to host people at Lake Martin for semester-long trainings in the deeper things of God. I want to wrap it up with a couple of few sentences. Give my wife the last word. We struggled coming to speak to you guys because uh, we cannot quite keep to one story. When and I have so many miracle stories. As we are walking with God, I want to tell you, it has never been easy to walk with God. There has never been a red carpet for me. There's always been boulders in the way. There's always been the impossible. But I want to tell you, seek first the kingdom of God, and everything will be added unto you if you can remember these two things. And these are my closing thoughts with you. We have so many stories, so many miracles to share. But I want to tell you, it's not easy. And I want to remind you of two simple things. You take care of God. And if you are yet to become a believer in the Lord, I urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't lollygag. Don't waste your life away. I was a teenager in absolute enamorment of the world, and I met Christ, and I will never go back. It's so vain and empty comparatively. But as you seek first, God will facilitate two things in your life to bring about everything that you need to fulfill the purpose He has in your life. Number one, it's going to take time. I've never met a person that can testify things with God happens overnight. I was 18 years old when God spoke to me, start a school. It only happened in 2007. I searched and wondered in confusion for years before God brought a property. Seeking first does not mean things just happen overnight. It takes time. And number two, and this is my final word, everything that God will get to you, every one, every person that God will get to you will be through a process. Money do not fall out of the sky. People do not drop out of heaven unless you're some comic book Marvel superhero. The way that God works is through time, and process. And if you stay in time and in God's timing and submit to the process, however absurd pulling weeds out of a garden may seem, God will make all things work together for you. Beloved, seek first and everything will be added unto you. When we were preparing, I got my Bible out and there was a footnote that I thought was very applicable for tying the scripture with what we had felt led to share. It says, putting God's kingdom first is the first step on the pathway to God's miracles. You cannot walk on this pathway unless determining his will and purpose and glory is your first priority as you pursue his call on your life.
So our invitation um, tonight is that God does have God's stories and miracles and a path ahead of you that is so supernatural and exciting and above and beyond anything you could ask for or imagine. And we hope that the little bit we've shared um, would encourage you that it is worth it to wait on the Lord, to lean into the Lord, to make him your reality, to be steeped in him. My dad has great advice uh, when it comes to God's will and spiritual living. Uh, he says, hear from the Lord and do what he says. And I think that fits in really well with this seek first principle. Um, we hear from the Lord and we predetermine that whatever he calls us to do, the answer is already yes. It's not always going to make sense. It's not always going to be a step forward. It's not always going to be crazy. For some of you, it might be to study and be faithful here at Samford and finish the degree that he's called you to get while you're here. But whatever it is, if you can predetermine that I'm going to say yes, I want the life that God has prepared for me, the pilgrimage that he's put before me. I want to seek first his kingdom and see God provision for him to add to me everything that I need to accomplish the calling on my life. Then what our lives testify to is that it's worth every yes, and it is more than you could ever imagine on your own. Uh, our heartbeat at Legacy is really just to walk people um, wherever you are. And, you know, our students are anywhere from new believers to um, faithful believers in the Lord. There's always more. And we love getting to be a part of people's lives and to, to just encourage you into more, to be encouraged ourselves into more. We certainly haven't arrived. And there's more that God wants us to step into and to trust him for. So our goal tonight was really just to use our God story and the miracles he's done in our life to serve as a, a powerful testimony of the seeking first, the kingdom of God, to steep our lives in the God reality that is available to us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these things will be added the cares, the concerns, the weights, the heaviness. You seek first and be about his business, and all these things will be added to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I would thank you for uh, listening, and thank you, Sanford University, and thank you to the Greek uh, board here for allowing us to share with you. Hey, it's been great. We love you, and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you guys.